thanks everyone for coming and for folks that are joining us online. Um, it looks like there's folks kind of in the nonprofit sector and in, involved in housing and in the equity co-op world. So certainly for anyone who is um, hiring staff or in an employment role, um, it's, it is important to stay up to date on the, um, on the changes. Um, for those of you that are here, you'll have a just a summary of changes, um, and I'll be going through those, and, and you know we'll, we'll be discussing them in a bit more detail. But um, this is just something for you to keep to have with you, just a, a sort of breakdown of, of the changes that were implemented by um, the previous government, and then the further changes by the uh, the new provincial government, um, many of which actually reversed the earlier changes. So um, I'm going to get started. Uh, just at the outset, I'll say that the information that I'm sharing today is legal information. It's not legal advice. So there are often people that have specific burning questions that relate to their employment setting, and I can't address those um, Today, we can certainly speak afterwards, but this is intended to be sort of a general overview of, uh, of information for you. So just to begin, um, the sort of uh, the main piece of legislation that governs employer-employee relationships in Ontario is the Employment Standards Act, um, and that is a piece of legislation that is administered by the Ministry of Labour. Um, and one thing that's important to note is that this legislation overrides anything that might appear in employment agreements that is uh, contradictory or contravenes uh, the legislation. And we'll get into some examples of that um, as we go along. But this is really the, uh, the main piece of legislation um, that sort of addresses uh, the rights and obligations of employers and employees in Ontario. Um, there are other pieces of legislation uh, that also apply. So in addition to the Employment Standards Act, uh, there's the Occupational Health and Safety Act. Um, some of you may be familiar with that legislation. Uh, it deals with workplace safety, um, things like harassment, uh, complaints procedures for workers who are experiencing um, harassment or unsafe workplaces. Uh, and it sets out obligations for the employer uh, in the event of those sorts of complaints. Uh, there's also the Human Rights Code, and some of you may be familiar with that legislation as well. Uh, that is basically a law that prevents discrimination um, in the employment context, as well as in other contexts. But for our purposes, um, it deals with the employment context, and it sets out certain protected grounds um, uh, that uh, Basically, individuals uh, are, are entitled to freedom from discrimination based on any of those grounds. And those include things like race, gender, um, gender identity, uh, place of origin, disability. It's a, it's a long list. And, and obviously, today, we're not going to deal with all of these um, you know, pieces of legislation. But it is important to keep in mind that it's a network of um, legislation that, that really sets out the obligations of both employers and, and employees. Um, in addition to the laws that are established by uh, the province, um, there are other uh, sort of governing rules and documents that can apply to the employer-employee relationship. So that includes employment agreements. For those of you that have hired uh, staff or have been hired yourselves, you'll probably, you probably signed an employment agreement and that confirms things like salary, uh, your working hours, probably some of the expectations of the role. There are also workplace policies. Um, again, for those of you that are operating in workplaces, you likely have policies around um, perhaps things like workplace anti-harassment and anti-violence policies. Um, the policies that might apply around leaves of absence or reporting sick days, you know, all of those sorts of things are often spelled out in workplace policies. Um, and then there's the common law, and that's, you know, that's really the law that fills in gaps um, and, and will 
we won't really speak about that at length, uh, but again, as I mentioned earlier, um, the Employment Standards Act states that um, it is not possible to contract out of or waive an employment standard. Um, and perhaps the best example I can give of this um, is with respect to termination of staff members. The Employment Standards Act sets out the minimum amount of notice or pay in lieu of notice that need to be, needs to be provided to employees who are being dismissed. Um, if you have an employment agreement uh, that violates the minimum standard with respect to that notice, that clause is not going to be enforceable. And in that case, the common law steps in and that fills in the amount of notice that you're required to give. Again, that's sort of a, it's a bit vague, but um, just to keep in mind that you really, you can't contract out of the minimum standards that are set out in the provincial legislation. Also, if anyone has questions as I'm going along, feel free to maybe put up your hand and, and ask the question. And because of the webinar, I'll have to repeat it here, but we can talk about it as we go. So what does the Employment Standards Act deal with? Um, it sets out standards um, with respect to overtime pay, minimum wage, um, public holidays, vacation benefits, leaves of absence, uh, termination, and also it explains how the act is enforced and how a complaint can be brought. And as I mentioned earlier, it's the Ministry of Labor that enforces the Employment Standards Act. So if there's a violation of the Employment Standards Act by an employer, um, uh, an employee can file a complaint with the Ministry of Labor and then they're responsible for investigating the matter. Uh, they could make an order for the employer to pay uh, unpaid wages. Um, they could make an order of, uh, with respect to a penalty if there has been a violation of the ESA. Um, but again, that's, that's the procedure for the enforcement of the Employment Standards Act. Um, it's important to keep in mind that uh, the Act doesn't apply to every single industry or profession, and I suspect for most of us here it, it does apply, but just to give you a sense of some of the uh, the jobs that have special rules that apply. It includes manufacturing, construction and mining, uh, hospitality, transportation, uh, agriculture. Uh, there are certain other industries and jobs that are not governed by the Employment Standards Act. But again, I think the assumption for most of us here is that it likely does apply uh, to, to your workplaces. Um, one thing that you may also want to keep in mind is that if you are operating in a unionized workplace, there are additional rules that are set out in the Labor Relations Act, um, and that governs the relationship between unions and employers. Um, how many of you do, uh, how many of those of us that are here do operate in a unionized workplace? Okay. All right, so that's fortuitous because we're going to be focusing on changes to the Employment Standards Act, but just to keep in mind that there is a separate a uh, piece of legislation that does apply if you are uh, in a unionized workplace. So just by way of overview, um, the history of the Employment Standards Act, I mean, it goes back, as you can imagine, many years. And the way that I think about it, I mean, it was introduced in 1920 when there were rules that were established with respect to minimum wage. I think about it as being incremental increases in the rights, uh, with respect to the rights of employees in the workplace um, as we've become more sort of aware of the context and some of the imbalances that exist in employment relationships. There have been increased allowances that have been given to employees. So just to give sort of a broad context, we began in, in the early kind of 1900s with the Minimum Wage Act. Uh, then we had legislation that dealt with hours of work, indication with pay. The first Employment Standards Act was developed in, uh, in 1968. Um, and since then, there have been further amendments, and some of those are set out here. So things like termination pay, pregnancy leave entitlements, um, the addition of public holidays. Um, and then in the 1980s, we saw um, uh, provisions that dealt with the amount of notice that needs to be provided to an employee at the time of termination. 
And then in the 1990s, we're looking at things like parental leave, employee wage protection, et cetera. So there's been a, a sort of uh, a history of increasing the entitlements of workers in the context of the employment relationship. Okay, so we have a question here. Okay, so the question is, what's the difference between termination pay and severance pay? Um, so the Employment Standards Act deals with both of those things. Uh, termination pay is actually described in terms of notice. It's the amount of notice that needs to be provided to an employee at the time of termination. Uh, it can either be notice in terms of time or pay in lieu of notice. So that would be termination pay. Uh, and the Act provides that termination pay or notice is one week per year of employment to a maximum of eight weeks. Severance pay um, is an additional entitlement that only applies in cases where the payroll is $2.5 million or more. So that applies only to limited workplaces. And so if you are assessing termination um, and you want to know whether you, you have obligations with respect to severance pay, that's what you would need to consider. The payroll, um, and I believe it's also uh, the number of employees in the workplace. So 50. Well, you're laying 50 off at a time. Yeah, I, I, so, so though severance pay doesn't apply across the board, but notice or pay in lieu of notice applies to employers across the board. Um, Unless you put it into your employment contract, which you might want to do. Right? Uh, sorry, so. If you put severance into your employment contract. Right, so the question is if you put severance into your employment contract. So remember again, you can't contract out of the minimum provisions in the Employment Standards Act. So you cannot, uh, you can't say if, you know, in the event of termination, you're not entitled to any severance pay. That's not going to be well, why held up. Oh, that you could include it. You're, you might not be obliged to, but you might say. Uh, so you can, yeah, you can include um, an allowance for severance pay, even if you're not required to do so. And one, I mean, termination is always that always becomes kind of a hot button issue, and the one that people are most interested in, probably because, um, well, it applies. You know, it's probably going to come up in every workplace, and in some ways, it involves the most liability to the employer. Um, one thing to keep in mind, again, and as Reba said, the Employment Standards Act really sets out minimum standards. So that doesn't mean that that's all that you can provide to your staff members in the same way that you're not necessarily giving people minimum wage, right? So at the time of termination, you can have provisions in the employment agreement that allow for more than one week per year worked. Um, and in fact, you know, again, going sort of Focusing on the issue of termination, we, we, we do often recommend doing that because you can get um, one of the benefits of providing for more notice or termination pay um, in an employment agreement is that one, it, you know you're not going to be found to be in violation of the Employment Standards Act because you're giving more than the minimum. But secondly, you can get a what's called a release from the employee confirming that they have no claim or legal action against you because they've basically been paid in excess of their entitlements. You can't get a release if you're only giving them their minimum entitlement under the Employment Standards Act because by law you're required to do that. So that's just one of the things to think about. If anyone, I mean, we also recommend if you are going through the process of terminating staff members or if you are on the other side of a termination as an employee, it's always worth getting some legal advice about whether you are uh, entitled to more than what you're being offered. And on the other side, if you're in the process of terminating staff, um, you know, the best, the fairest and best way to do that. Um, and again, remember in the Employment Standards Act, it's not actually described as termination pay, it's described as notice. Um, which could also mean that somebody works through a period. Um, it's called working notice. So one week per year worked could mean that they're, you give them notice that they're going to be terminated effective, say, three weeks from now, and they work through that notice period. That is an option that's available to employers. Um, Okay, so this is just, we're just still going through the history of the ESA. Um, in 2000, we saw the amendments to the legislation, many of which 
are, you know, things that are still in place and that um, are obviously important in the context of sort of modern employment relationships, things like hours of work, what constitutes overtime, uh, mandatory rest periods for staff members, uh, job protected leave, so the ability to take leave from your position without having your job sort of be in jeopardy because you're absent, um, requirements to post you know, by the employer on um, some of the uh, uh, provisions set out in the ESA, uh, and then uh, enforcement tools. So what the Ministry of Labor can do and what employment standards officers can do uh, in the event that there is a violation of the ESA. So now we get into really what today's presentation is about, um, and that is it's two bills, Bill 148, which was passed in 2017, and Bill 47, which was passed in, uh, in 2018. So this is just the overview. And again, we will get into each of these changes in more detail as we go along. But Bill 148 was called the Fair Workplaces Better Jobs Act. Um, it was enacted by the Liberal government, and it was passed in November 2017. And for anyone following the news at that time, you probably heard people talking about uh, what I think was the um, perhaps the, the, the change that received the most attention, which was the proposed increase to minimum wage. Um, and you'll recall that uh, that section uh, of the Employment Standards, Act, Employment Standards Act, which provided for minimum wage, uh, was basically amended. Uh, to allow for an increase of minimum wage to $14 that was effective in 2018 um, with a proposed increase to $15 in January of 2019. And I believe minimum wage previously had been around $11. So this was, there was a lot of discussion about this change and you saw probably many business people who were complaining about it and then you saw folks who were talking about what an important gain it was for, for workers. So that was one of the big changes that was introduced by the Liberal government with this bill. There were also changes to scheduling for on-call positions. So people that were operating in um, on-call positions, for example, superintendents in, in housing organizations um, where they were required to be on-call but not necessarily called in, there were changes to, um, to scheduling there. There was an increase to vacation time for employees who worked in the same position for five or more years, and there was an increase to personal emergency leave. And again, this is just a high level kind of overview, and we'll get into each of these as we go along with the presentation. So this was passed in, uh, this bill was passed in November 2017, and it basically implemented these changes to the Employment Standards Act. Um, as you know, uh, a new government was elected in 2018, and they, in turn, passed Bill 47, which was called the Making Ontario Open for Business Act. Um, that bill basically reversed a number of the amendments that had been made to the Employment Standards Act. Um, and that's kind of where we're at now. So that's why it's been a little bit, for, for anyone that's been trying to stay on top of changes to employment legislation, it was one big set of changes, and you probably heard a lot about it, and the need to stay you know, sort of current with those changes. Um, and then in January of this year, a number of those changes have been repealed. So in some ways, we're back where we started. But as you'll see as we continue this discussion, um, some of the changes have sort of stuck. So um, we'll, we'll get into what exactly that looks like. OK. So minimum wage, again. And, and the way that I'm going to talk about this is by comparing Bill 148, which was the uh, the first bill that was passed to implement certain amendments to the ESA, and then Bill 47, which was passed most recently, and that's what's currently in place. So with respect to minimum wage, Bill 148 increased minimum wage from $11.60 an hour to $14 an hour, and there was a further scheduled increase that was set to take effect in January of 2019. When the Ford government was elected and passed Bill 47, uh, they basically uh, froze minimum wage at $14 per hour, and that freeze will continue until October 1st of 2020. So 
that's, you know, there isn't going to be a further increase until after that date. And what they're proposing to do is to make um, any further increase comparable with inflation. So that's how they have sort of structured the new provisions around minimum wage in Ontario. So that's something to remember. Minimum wage is basically going to be frozen until October 2020 at $14. After that date, um, it's going to be, uh, the increases will be indexed to inflation. And as you can imagine, there, you know, um, again, for those of you that were following the election and, and, and after the election, the you know, the, the justification that's been put forward by the Conservative government is that the increase was too, too much too soon um, and uh, it was, you know, uh, they, that's sort of how they justified it and, and how they've justified freezing minimum wage. On the other side, um, those who are in support of Bill 148 have sort of said minimum wage has been out of whack with the cost of living for for a long time and, and it needed to be increased. So we do have the increase to $14 an hour, but we don't have any further scheduled increases aside from the acknowledgement that there will be an increase uh, to match inflation. Okay. So again, the way that this looks in the Employment Standards Act, it appears in Section 23. Um, and it says on or after January 1st, 2018, but before October 1st, 2020, the amount set out below for the following classes of employees will be minimum wage. And you'll see here again, as I mentioned, it's important if you're dealing with certain types of industries or areas to, to pay attention to what the rules are that apply. So there is a separate provision that deals with students who are employed, who are under 18 years of age. Um, there are separate rules that apply to um, individuals who are serving uh, liquor um, and are governed by the Liquor License Act, um, hunting and fishing guides, uh, home workers, but we're sort of mostly focused on section five of this provision, which says for any other employees, it's $14 per hour. And then as you can see, it says from October 1st, 2020 onwards, um, the amount determined under subsection 4, which talks about the increase being based on inflation. Okay, so that's, that's one of the important takeaways. Uh, second change and change back um, is with respect to equal pay for equal work. One of the big changes that the Liberal government introduced with Bill 148 uh, was e a requirement uh, and basically a prohibition on employers paying different rates of pay based on employment status in cases where staff were performing substantially the same kind of work, the performance required substantially the same skill, effort, and responsibility, and they were working under similar working conditions. And where this becomes most relevant is when you're talking about part-time versus full-time staff. You're talking about temporary staff who are being hired, for example, through a temporary agency. You might have seasonal or casual workers. So under the former legislation, employers were prohibited from paying um, staff different amounts dependent on their status. If they were doing the same kind of work that required the same kind of skill and they were working in the same environment, they needed to be paid the same amount. And again, I think you know, perhaps the best example of this is in a workplace where you have you know, some people that are there on a full-time basis and other folks that are there part-time, or you're hiring certain people through a third-party agency. Um, under the former uh, legislation, you couldn't have different rates of pay. And so if there was an employee who was receiving, say, uh, less pay than somebody who was doing the same work, because of their status, they would have grounds to file a complaint with the Ministry of Labor. Yep, sure. Question. So, what about if there are two employees in the same responsibilities? However, one employee with their full time status and over the other one with their part time status, they would not have the increases. And then uh, just hire, but then have all those years of service. Right, so the question has to do with um, whether seniority. Um, applies to this and it doesn't. So there was not, uh, the rule doesn't apply um, if the difference in pay is made on the basis of a seniority or merit system, um, systems that measure earnings by quantity or quality of production. Um, and 
certain other factors. But that's the short answer, and that's a great question because I'm sure that applies in many workplaces where you have somebody that's been there for you know, 10 or 12 years and someone who's just started, and somebody will be given increases to their pay uh, based on um, seniority. Um, either way, um, basically the, uh, the new act um, has made uh, changes to the, uh, the legislation that was brought in by the Liberal government. Um, it has maintained the requirement for equal pay uh, for equal work that relates to gender. So you can't have a, you know, a staff member who's male doing the same work as a female staff member and being paid more. However, it's repealed all of the, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> it's repealed all of the requirements for equal pay for equal work that relate to employment status. Um, and it's also repealed the employee's right to request a review of their rate of pay. So again, this means that uh, it has set back employees who are in the position of um, doing casual or seasonal work, who are employed on a part-time basis. It is now permissible for an employer to offer a different rate of pay to those staff members than they would to, say, a full-time staff member who's present. Um, Again, this has received a, a lot of attention precisely because um, it, you know, uh, it, it, there's a concern about maintaining inequality um, in the workplace for its, those staff members who are working on a temporary uh, seasonal or casual basis. Um, but unfortunately, that's the, that is the current state of the legislation. I just want to, I mean, I'm sure this is clear to, to, to everyone that's here and that's participating online. Um, just because this is now permissible in the ESA obviously doesn't mean that those of us that are in employment positions should be, um, you know, uh, sort of rushing to offer different rates of pay to people that are occupying different positions. The Employment Standards Act, though, sets out protections for workers, and so unfortunately this change means that, um, again, staff who are working um, uh, part-time or on a temporary basis um, may be receiving less pay than their counterparts who are doing the same work um, but are again are, are working full-time and they wouldn't have grounds to file a complaint on the basis of um, inequality um, and the section of the Employment Standards Act that deals with um, what we've just discussed is section 42 again it's maintained uh, the uh, restriction or prohibition on paying employees of one sex uh, a rate of pay less than the rate paid to an employee of the other sex where they're performing the same kind of work. The performance requires substantially the same skill, effort, and responsibility, and the work is performed under similar working conditions. These are the exceptions that we discussed earlier. Subsection 1 does not apply when the difference uh, in the rate of pay is made on the basis of seniority, a merit system, um, a system that measures earnings by quantity or quality of production, or any other factor uh, other than sex. Um, uh, again, there is, you know, uh, section, subsection 5 of this, uh, this provision in the ESA um, allows an employment standards officer to find that an employer has contravened subsection 1, and in that case they might determine the amount owing to an employee as a result of the contravention, and those would be deemed to be unpaid wages. So for example, if you do have a female employee who's doing substantially the same kind of work as her male counterpart, um, requires the same skill, they're working in similar working conditions, she's receiving less pay, she could file a complaint with the Ministry of Labor, um, it would be investigated by the employment standards officer um, and they could find that she is in fact entitled to back pay as unpaid wages for the difference in pay um, between what she was earning and what her male counterpart was earning. It is interesting and I, you know, I, I think the um, section 42.1b uh, is interesting. Their performance requires substantially the same skill, effort, and responsibility. You wonder how that would be determined and whether that might give room for an employer to say, well, even if they were operating in a similar position and title, in fact, 
this person required, you know, this role in fact required greater amounts of skill or effort. But that's just, uh, that's something to bear in mind. Um, I think one of the other unintended or perhaps intended consequences and perhaps implications of this is that employers may in fact now want to hire uh, staff to whom they can pay less than they would perhaps a full-time employee. They may be rushing to do that in order to reduce the amount that they're paying out because it's now uh, under the legislation they can do that. Are there any questions with what we've talked about so far? No? Fraser, I don't know if folks online are, okay, great. Okay, so we will move on. Uh, one of the other <coughs> areas of change that I mentioned at the outset was with respect to on-call scheduling. Um, under the former legislation, uh, there were significant protections that were introduced for on-call workers. Um, basically, uh, any employee that was working in an on-call capacity and was required to be on call would be entitled to a minimum of three hours pay even if they were not called into work. That was under the previous legislation. Um, additionally, under Bill 148, on-call employees could refuse an employer's request to work or be on call for an unscheduled day if the request was made less than 96 hours before the time that they were expected to start work and be on call. Um, it's important to keep in mind that none of these protections existed previously in the legislation for on-call workers. So again, the example I gave before, which might be familiar to those of us that are working in, uh, in, in the nonprofit housing sector, is for uh, an on-call superintendent or an on-call maintenance person where they are required to be available, for example, overnight or, you know, um, over a certain period of time, they may not be called in. Um, under the former, uh, prior to this, uh, this bill being introduced, they wouldn't be entitled to any pay if they weren't called in for that time. Um, and there, there wasn't any protection that allowed, allowed them to refuse shifts if they were, if they were called in. Um, so with this, with this legislative change, um, they would be entitled to a minimum of three hours paid just by, by virtue of being on call. Um, and they did have the right to refuse um, shifts if they weren't given adequate notice of those shifts. Um, they also had the right to receive wages if a scheduled workday or on-call period was canceled with less than 48 hour, hours notice. If that occurred, they'd be entitled to wages for three hours of work. Um, and there was also the ability to request changes to their schedule or work location after three months of employment. Um, so this is the shortest of all of the uh, all of the, uh, the changes we've discussed so far, all of the provisions that relate to on-call work have now been repealed. So we've actually gone back to where we were in the Employment Standards Act prior to the introduction of Bill 148. So basically this means you can ask a staff member to be on call um, for any period of time. If they're not called in during that time, you're not required to pay them. Um, they're not entitled to refuse shifts if they're not given adequate notice. Um, and if you are an employer, you can cancel those shifts and not, you know, perhaps not have to pay them, um, you know, as a result of having canceled the on-call uh, scheduling. So this is, uh, you know, uh, the, this, this does represent, um, I think, a, a significant setback for, um, for employees that are working in an on-call capacity. Again, um, for those of us that are administering on-call contracts, you can provide in your contract, you could actually mirror your contract to allow for the protections that existed under the former ESA, um, the protections that were set out in Bill 148. Um, for example, you could state that if you, know, if, if you are required to be on-call, you will receive three hours pay even if you're not called in. Remember again, and I know I've said this a few times, but I think it bears mentioning, the ESA really sets out minimum standards that an employer is required to uphold. In terms of the workplace, I think many of us want and benefit from greater entitlements than the bare minimums, but um, this is, uh, 
this is sort of the state of, uh, of the legislation as it relates to on-call scheduling. There's a question here. So the question relates to, it's in the context of nonprofit housing or co-op, where you have a co-op member who is, who's carrying out on-call shifts. Um, and the question is whether you could uh, offer to give them three hours pay instead of honorarium. Uh, that, that is a, I mean, it's not different, but it is in some way they're receiving benefit for their employment. If there's an honorarium, um, sometimes there's housing that's attached to their position, et cetera. If there are those benefits, then, then they are receiving you know, uh, some consideration for their work. Um, you could certainly, uh, if you wanted to, cancel the honorarium and instead provide for um, three hours pay every time they're required to be on call. That's certainly something that you could do. Um, again, it is, it, we move into a bit of uh, different territory when we're talking about um, benefits such as accommodation and, you know, stipend or something like that for folks that are working on call, especially if they live in the building. Um, but there's, you know, certainly you could consider doing something like that if, if it worked with your uh, with your model. Okay, one of the, I think this is one of the last uh, changes we'll talk about, uh, and it relates to personal leave. So, um, Bill 148 required employers to give all employees 10 personal emergency leave days per year, including two paid days uh, if the employee had been employed for one week or longer. Um, and uh, those were 10 days that could really um, uh, be used to deal with any, any form of personal emergency. Um, uh, it was available to all staff members regardless of the size of the workplace. Um, and one of the interesting um, sort of uh, provisions of this session is that the employer could ask for reasonable evidence of a need to take leave but could not ask for a medical note. Um, previously, before the enactment of uh, these amendments, the employer was entitled to ask for a medical note to justify the leave that was being taken by the employee. With Bill 148, that, that, was, that was removed, um, although they could ask for reasonable evidence. Um, so that was the, that was the change uh, that was implemented with Bill 148. With Bill 47, and again, this is where we're at now, um, the personal emergency leave provisions were repealed, and the, uh, the legislation now sets out eight days instead of 10. There are no paid days. Recall that before it was 10 days of leave with two paid days. Now it's eight days of leave with, with um, no pay. And on top of that, they have designated types of leave that an employee is entitled to take. So there's sick leave, um, so that could be personal illness, injury, or a medical emergency. Three days for family responsibility leave, that could be an illness, injury, or medical emergency that affects a family member. And uh, I believe that the legislation actually spells out who qualifies as a family member for this section. So you would. It, there's a possibility you wouldn't actually be entitled to take that leave if it affected somebody who was outside the prescribed class of family members. Um, and two days for bereavement leave. And again, that related to uh, prescribed individuals. So um, it really has, uh, in many ways, in addition to reducing the number of days of leave, um, it has sort of imposed certain types of uh, requirements for the leave that a person is taking. Um, it is, in terms of the evidence that's required, um, again, employers may require employees to provide evidence reasonable in the circumstances for leave, um, and that could include provision of a medical note. So they're no longer prevented from asking for that. Yes? So what happens if somebody is sick for more than three days in a year? Like that, does, it doesn't not family responsibility, not bereavement, what happens when somebody is sick or more? I mean, you know, most people, yep. like three is pretty minimal for a full-time worker. Absolutely. So the question is what happens if somebody is sick for more than three days of the year? So, uh, I mean, it's a good question, and, and these are, um, 
I mean, again, remember these are the minimum standards. This is what the employer is absolutely required to give. Um, if they don't give this, they could be dealing with a report and complaint to the Ministry of Labor and they could be dealing with a penalty. One thing that I imagine applies in most of your workplaces is a, you know, you're probably allotted a number of sick days. You probably have a policy around that. Um, and that, that policy would apply assuming it provides for at least three days of sick leave. Um, but really, I mean, these are, uh, again, these are the, um, the minimum standards that are required. So yeah. is, it, is it normal in a, in a employment contract or within your policy manual to have how many sick days you can take in a year? Like, uh, that's not in our policy manual okay. at all. Uh, yeah, so I mean, we're not going to. Right. Well, so right. Is something normal that you would put in? I mean, we just say, you know, if you're, if you're sick, don't come to work for that. It's normal as soon as you can. Mm -hmm. uh, but so the question is if it's normal to have a policy around sick days in an employment agreement. Um, and, you know, it, it does depend on the workplace. I've seen, you know, you might have in your employment contract, these are the number of days you're entitled to take as sick days. Um, you might have a separate policy that deals with sick days. Um, I mean, one thing to keep in mind, and, and you asked Reba, if somebody takes more than that number, those number of sick days, can they be laid off? And we haven't really gotten into the Human Rights Code in our discussion here, but there are protections for staff around disability. So if you know, you're dealing with a situation where somebody has been away because they're sick, and they've given you whatever information you require to confirm that they are away because of a medical condition, disability, or sickness, um, you'd be at risk of a claim of discrimination if you did terminate them or penalize them for being away from the workplace. But if it just seemed to be absenteeism masquerading as illness, yeah, that so would be more of an internal yeah, so, no, it's a, it's a great question, but what if somebody is absent for days on end and they are not providing you with the medical information or the information you or need? They take every, two, every two weeks they're off. Or they take every yeah. two weeks off. Uh, you know, yeah. They off every two weeks, but it's, so it's disruptive. Sure, so if you have, and, and it's, I've actually, it's a whole separate presentation on absenteeism and, and uh, uh, human rights and discipline in the workplace, but, it's a, it's a delicate balancing act of determining, first of all, whether the absences are related to a potential medical condition or disability. If they are, um, as an employer, you have a duty to accommodate staff that have a disability. Um, that could mean, you know, um, altering the schedule, allowing them to work from home. There are all sorts of different accommodations that can be applied. If, however, you determine that them being present is an essential component of the job, them being physically present, and you've tried to accommodate and it's not working, um, you may in fact have fulfilled your obligations under the Human Rights Code and you may be able to proceed with terminating that staff member, but it is very much based on the facts. Um, we certainly don't recommend going down that road if you're in the position of an employer without at least consulting with a lawyer just to give them the overview of facts because, again, there are protections for staff um, around disability and that's important to ensure that everybody, you know, can, can have a job uh, even if they are dealing with a disability or a medical condition. Um, but the issue of absenteeism and how it intersects with, uh, with disability and human rights code, is a, it's a very loaded question and it's, um, there are also employment cases where you have staff who've been away on short-term disability for two, three, you know, short-term disability turns into long-term disability. Are they, are they still an employee, you know, three years down the road? Um, and there are cases where the court has considered how long they've been, how long they've been an employee. If an employer has a long-term disability plan, in a way, does it mean that they're acknowledging they could have a situation where a staff member's on leave for an extended period of time? So that's kind of how, um, that's kind of how that's assessed, um, and it is very much a, a, a factual sort of determination. Yeah, another question. Two days for leave of leave. At what point, I thought we had three days. I can't remember what I was going to do with 
that that would not impact the post-op memory of the case. Okay. So I don't understand. Is that still in effect? Is COM2 is on top of the three? No. Uh, so the question is whether it, there, there's a recollection of three days of bereavement leave. It, I mean, again, I would imagine that many of us have employment policies that allow for... No. So again, these are the minimum standards. So somebody cannot be fired, for example, for taking... If they took two days of bereavement leave uh, related to the death of some of the prescribed people that are set out in the legislation and they were fired, they would have grounds to complain to the Ministry of Labor. But you might have an internal workplace policy that says you're entitled to three days of bereavement leave and also we don't care who's passing your, you know, who, who, who's passed away, you're entitled to do that. And um, again, these are um, minimums. These are minimums and I would expect that for many of us, our employment agreements provide for more than this the same way that for many of us we're probably getting more than minimum wage. Um, that's the way to look at it. This is the bare minimum, okay? All right, so let's just get through the rest of these. Vacation, uh, that's, this is one perk, I suppose, is that the vacation, the changes to vacation have not been repealed with Bill 47. So under uh, the original bill, Bill 148, employers were required to give employees with at least five years of service three weeks of vacation. Um, that has stayed the same. So if you have uh, staff who have worked uh, with you for at least five years, they're entitled to three weeks vacation. Again, that doesn't mean that that's all that you need to provide them. It means that this is the minimum. And if some of you are working um, with folks that are out looking for work or that are employed and maybe dealing with um, potentially unfair employment practices, something to keep in mind that if they've been employed for five years or more with the same employer, they're entitled to three weeks of vacation. Um, Okay, one of the, I think this is actually the last one, I know I said this earlier, but um, one of the other changes that's been uh, unfortunately introduced with the new legislation um, deals with the classification of somebody as a contractor versus an employee. And I don't know how many of you deal with this in, in your specific work environments, but there is a distinction between somebody that's hired as an independent contractor and an employee. Uh, one of the main distinctions being that an employer doesn't necessarily make the statutory deductions for a contractor as they would for an employee and they're not contributing to CPP and EI um, for a contractor. Uh, they could also get around providing benefits if somebody's hired as an independent contractor. They may not be receiving any of the workplace benefits. Um, and unfortunately, I think that uh, the, the classification of certain people as, as contractors is less of a burden on the employer. And for that reason, there are employers who have tried to characterize people as independent contractors when in fact, when you look at you know, the type of work they're doing and who's directing their work, they are employees. And for that reason, uh, Bill 148 basically introduced um, a prohibition on misclassifying employees, and they added a reverse onus for the employer to prove that a person is a contractor and not an employee. What that means is that, and sorry, I should go back, one of the other big distinctions between um, the entitlements of an independent contractor versus an, independent, versus an employee is that in terminating an independent contractor, employer is not required to give notice or pay in lieu of notice. So you could have a situation where somebody's worked with you for 10 years and you've called them an independent contractor and you fire them and you don't give them any kind of notice or pay in lieu of notice, um, you would be able to say, well, they're an independent contractor um, and that, would, that could fly if you weren't subject to further investigation. The previous legislation basically added a reverse onus for the employer to prove that someone was a contractor, not an employee. Um, so basically, it was a disincentive for employers to characterize people as contractors. Um, Bill 47 has removed the reverse onus. So again, this could result in employers wanting to hire folks as independent contractors rather than as employees in order to get around their obligations 
um, to those people. Also for independent contractors, the Employment Standards Act just doesn't apply. So, you know, in terms of vacation pay, uh, vacation entitlements, um, sick leave, all the rest of it, are not entitled to any of those protections. And there was a question here. So, what previous to this, previous to Bill 148, yes. what, where we can we make that? Right, so that's a great question. It's whether prior to the distinctions being set out in the ESA, Revenue Canada would have made the distinctions. So, as I mentioned, one of the key differences between independent contractors and employees is that you're not making the required remittances to Revenue Canada for your independent contractors, you could be subject to an audit and an investigation by the CRA, um, and that's totally aside from, from this issue. But remember, the, the Revenue Canada's focus is on whether you're making the deductions from pay. Um, the Employment Standards Act deals with overall protections of workers, so there is a different focus there, but you're absolutely right, and in fact, um, there's a test that uh, Revenue Canada applies to determine whether somebody is an independent contractor or an employee regardless of what they're named. It has to do with the substance of their position. So, for example, if you have somebody who's been working for you for 10 years and you call them an independent contractor but they're coming into work every day, they're using your computer, you're setting their schedule, um, you know, more than likely the conclusion by Revenue Canada would be that that person is an employee and not an independent contractor and in that case you're liable for all of the deductions you should have made and possibly a penalty as well. Um, so it is, I mean, it's important to be aware of some of the implications of mischaracterizing staff as independent contractors rather than employees. Again, you know, the uh, what Bill 148 did is it made statutory prohibition on doing that. Um, so again, it probably operated as a, as a greater disincentive, um, and that's now gone. So still important to be aware um, of you know uh, some of the some of the risks um, of uh, of mischaracterizing people. So just broadly speaking, what are the implications? Uh, of the changes we've discussed today. Um, so as you saw, there have been a number of changes and further changes to the Employment Standards Act in the past two years with Bill 148 and Bill 47. One thing that's important to note is that just because certain protections have been stripped away by the legislation, that doesn't mean that employers can make unilateral changes to employment agreements. And the reason that this is included here is that when Bill 148 kind of came into being, a lot of employers and workplaces made changes to their employment agreements to bring them in line with what was set out in the ESA. That might relate to minimum wage, that might relate to the number of personal leave days you were giving staff members, um, it would relate to any of the changes that were brought in and you might have done that for existing staff and you might have done that for staff that were coming in. Just because those protections or some of them have been removed does not mean that you can go back to your employment agreement and cross things out and say, well, the law has changed now, you're only entitled to eight personal leave days and not ten. Uh, remember, an employment agreement can and often does provide for greater protections than the Employment Standards Act. And an employment agreement is a contract. It's, a, it's an agreement that's reached between two parties. It cannot be changed unilaterally by one party. So if you are in the position of now wanting to strip back certain things that you previously provided as a benefit, you need to have a discussion with the employee uh, and make sure that they agree. And if they don't, um, and you just change an employment agreement, you could be at risk of a, a claim for constructive dismissal. Um, and, and really, you could have an, an agreement that's not valid if you've changed it on one side without the agreement of the other party. Um, it's, it's very risky to do that. So for those of you that are in workplaces where you've made changes to your policies, you've made changes to employment agreements in order to match some of the greater entitlements under the previous legislation. 
My suggestion would be to, you know, unless you need to make changes to those things to keep them in, uh, because otherwise you're dealing with the process of basically rolling back policies um, and having to enter into fresh discussions with staff about what their entitlements might be. So, I mean, I don't know how relevant this is to uh, the workplaces that are sort of represented here today, but thinking about, for example, folks that were working in minimum wage positions who were getting $11, you know, and change an hour, then they were getting $14, um, and you know, they might have been given a further bump in light of that, and now minimum wage has been fixed at $14. The employer can't just go back to their employment agreement and say, well, you know, the Ford government has changed these terms now, and you're only entitled to $14, even though we said 15 initially, to allow for the further change that was going to be implemented in January. Um, that's, that's extremely risky. So we, we certainly um, suggest that you get legal advice if you are considering making any further changes to policies based on um, the amendments that have come with Bill 47. That's, that's really it from my end in terms of a, an overview of the changes to the Employment um, Standards Act. Again, uh, I just want to um, mention and reiterate that this is one of a few pieces of legislation that govern employment relationships. There's also the Occupational Health and Safety Act. There's the Human Rights Code. So for those of you that are either managing a workplace or you are staff in a workplace, this is one piece of legislation that sets out your rights and obligations. You also have further uh, rights and further obligations under other pieces of legislation. Um, but that's, that is it for, for the presentation. So if anyone has questions, either uh, those of you that are present um, and attending this morning or who are participating online, I'm happy to, to answer those. Do we, do we hit all the questions as we were going? OK. Fraser, is there? Nothing from online, but I might do a few seconds behind, so. OK. Well, we can, yeah, we can certainly wait. And hopefully everyone got a copy of the handout. I don't, the person that came in a little bit later. Hi. Um, there's, there's some handouts here. Okay, you have a copy, great. And we'll send them to everyone online. Okay, yeah, and for anyone that's participating online, we'll send a copy of that, uh, the summary of changes uh, to you. All right, well, thanks everyone for coming. I hope that was, somewhat helpful and not, not too much information. Um, but again, this, the handout has the kind of overview, so you can take a look at that. And I hope everyone has a good rest of your day. <laughs>